Um, so uh, I, I'm grateful for all of you um, being in attendance in person and also virtually through WebEx. Um, it is an honor to, to be here. I thank Dr. Rutberg for the invitation to speak. Um, so I am going to um, speak about um, the project we have going on in Southeast Asia, and specifically I'll be talking about Thailand uh, on Asian, um, Asian elephant rescue rehabilitation and rewilding. Um, before I do that, I do want to just speak briefly about um, my dog Mulligan because Tufts Veterinary School has a very um, close place in my heart because um, Mulligan, he's since passed um, in 2008, but um, he was treated very um, well, um, both on, from a personal standpoint and both a veterinary care perspective um, when he had a, a space um, filling uh, brain tumor, choroid plexus papilloma, and he received um, radiation treatment here at Tufts. And I, would, I lived in Amherst, Massachusetts at the time, and we would drive him um, for each treatment. Um, and he was just very well taken care of. And I, we had two more years together, even though the prognosis was maybe six months, even with the treatment, but we had two more years, and it was just a really blessed time. So it's it, um, Tufts, is, this vet school is really, like I said, close to my heart for that reason. And as he was, I'll just tell a funny story that I often use in some of my behavior classes, and maybe Katie actually remembers, um, it's been a while, um, when he was actually feeling the effects of the, the radiation and feeling better. So in the beginning, we'd have to physically carry him in. And then as he, the, the tumor was shrinking and he was um, returning to his wonderful self, he, he was, became resistant. He's like, I'm done. I don't want to go in there anymore. As lovely as the people are, I'm sort of done with it. And um, we, would, we would just scatter kibble. He was still very food motivated, and we would scatter kibble um, across the parking lot. And so I use this as a kind of runway test <laughs> of motivation. Um, and he would slowly get there and walk in on, um, on his own. So anyway, thanks to Tops Veterinary School for giving me more time um, with Mulligan. Um, I just, uh, Dr. Rutberg spoke just very briefly about some of the um, lovely animals I've had the, um, the chance to work with, and I just wanted to um, speak briefly about them a little bit more, just to give a context about the kind of work that I do. So I do self-identify as a conservation behaviorist. I'm also trained as an animal welfare scientist. My PhD was in an animal welfare program at the University of British Columbia. Um, and I always pose the question to students and other people, is there a more um, sort of concise way of putting that all together that I could uh, self-identify as is because it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, so I've had the pleasure of working with jumping spiders. Um, I call them the cute and furry of the arachnid world. Um, and they sort of led me into thinking about conservation and behavior because I was interested in looking at how an animal's movement by, might be affected by um, fragmented habitat, but working on a scale that was relevant to the species. And that led me to um, jumping spiders because of their, they're so visual. I've had the honor of working with um, Stevens kangaroo rat on translocation studies, looking at individual variation in personality. And that was when in and, um, my sort of bringing it all together and thinking about behavior and conservation, but also the role of the individual. Um, and I have, so in terms of more current projects, um, I have um, a master's student looking at the uh, effect of human disturbance on kangaroo, um, eastern gray kangaroos in New South Wales, Australia. Um, so looking at sort of the varying degree of disturbance and how that's affecting their populations and at the individual level. So one of the, the key behaviors we're looking at is how often the, jo the joeys who are in that in-out um, pouch emergence stage, how often they have the chance to actually be out, explore their environment, engage with others, etc. Um, I have another student who um, is working at Burger Zoo in the Netherlands, um, looking at um, the role of social disturbance on fundamental characteristics such as personality. Um, so how social disturbance, so in this case of the chimpanzee colony, so um, chimps that have um, been introduced to the colony or taken apart, taken away, how that affects the manifestation of things such as personality. Um, 
I do, I have worked with pigs in the past and will continue to do that now that I'm rolling out um, a uh, farm animal um, uh, project looking at well-being, emotion, cognition, and behavior, but we're doing this in a sanctuary, at farm, a farm animal sanctuary at Woodstock. Um, farm animal sanctuary in High Falls, New York. So looking at these typically farm species um, for themselves, on behalf of themselves, so outside of this sphere of industry. Um, and um, in the past, I've also um, worked with, so that's, those are Chakma baboons from um, a population in Cape Town, South Africa. And um, there was a master's student looking at um, non-lethal ways of mitigating um, baboon human conflict. Okay. So now I leading into Asian elephants, um, to give some context to the work that I do, we're thinking about the, the fact that more live in some form of captivity um, throughout their rangeland, and you might say um, throughout the world, than do in the wild. So most of my talk is going to be focused on Thailand. So uh, some of the statistics will be specific to Thailand. So in Thailand, for example, there's an estimated, and it's very hard to nail down these numbers, um, but there's an estimated 25 to 3,200 living in the wild, whereas about 4,500 are living in some form of captivity. Let's see if we can advance the slide. So this is not an atypical um, image of a, an, a camp elephant. Um, so this is a, a, a tourist camp, right? So this elephant is, you, and you can see the short chain that they're on. Um, and so typically they're kept constrained in this way until they're um, tasked with something tourist related, whether it's giving a ride, whether it's performing, whether it's to go bathe, depending upon the camp, et cetera. Um, and I just want to give, uh, just pause here for a second and just maybe give a brief history of, um, the, the emergence of um, the elephant tourism industry in Thailand. So in 1989, there was a ban on logging. And, that, and elephants were often used to assist with logging. Um, so when the ban on logging um, came about, um, and, the ban, and there was also a ban of logging with elephants, so there, there emerged this term of the unemployed elephant. What are we then going to do with these elephants have, that have no, no job, no task? And tied to that was the fact that their, and we use the term mahout, or their keeper, um, was used to making an income from their elephant. And so because of this, um, this, this notion of an unemployed elephant, um, the, the elephant tourism industry sort of, sort of burgeoned from that um, to find a role or a job for these elephants. And so we could talk another time or after about what does that even mean to be an unemployed or employed elephant. So again, this is not atypical for some of the, for the tourist camps. So you might look at this and say, oh my god, how beautiful this elephant is, um, has this artistic ability and is um, drawing another elephant. This is usually done through some sort of coercion. Um, it's, it's not a natural expression of artistic endeavor by the elephant. It usually comes through, um, like I said, some type of coercion um, and for tips from the, from the tourists. Right, then you have um, elephants that are being asked to perform and ask. So it's not that these elephants can't, obviously they can um, take on these positions. They'll do that to forage, etc. cetera. But um, this is not something, you know, they're doing it at the behest um, of, of people um, and for, for others, for pure, for pure entertainment. Let's see. And then um, a lot of the tourist camps will offer treks. Um, and I, I think of this as insult to injury. And the reason I sort of describe it that way is because you have elephants who are forced to trek tourists around, um, bear the burden of, of these chairs, which are difficult given their spinal structure. Um, sometimes the chairs aren't removed in, when they should be. Um, sometimes they're giving treks quite often. Um, and the insult to injury comes in the fact that they're being trekked through their, often their native habitat, their native forage. And they're not given the time to stop and actually 
consume any of that forage or explore any of that environment, right? So you can imagine how difficult that might be for an animal such as an elephant to be deprived, to be forced to um, engage in this activity and then to be deprived of something so crucial, crucial to them, such as um, natural forage. So this species, I'm sure not surprising to any of you, is um, listed as endangered throughout its rangeland. And um, according to researchers, according to the IUCN, major threats include habitat loss and um, human-elephant conflict, right? So habitat loss is due to um, direct destruction of their, um, of, the, of their habitat, expansion of human settlements, um, and so forth. So be, given the, the threats that are identified, the IUCN priorities include the, the conservation and the protection of habitat, the increased connectivity of fragments, um, also finding ways to mitigate and manage human-elephant um, conflict, and also trying to improve policy legislation, the law, regulations to help deter um, poaching, trade in elephants, and so forth. But it's important to keep in mind that those priorities, those threats, are, are focused on the wild population. They're not really including or speaking of those elephants that are in, living in some form of captivity, which, which refers to the majority of Asian elephants, right? So I'm asking what of, and others have asked this too, what of the, this captive population, right? And so have they been dispossessed of their species status, right? And all that that might entail from a protection um, perspective, from a biological perspective, a cognitive perspective, and so forth, even an ecological perspective, an evolutionary perspective. Have they been dispossessed of those characteristics? So I would like to introduce you, um, because in general um, talks, I try to avoid giving too much specifics about our elephants and our locations for protection. Um, but I do, I, I'm gonna introduce her um, um, without speaking her name. Um, but this is an elephant who was, um, you can see part of a elephant tourist camp. I'm talking about the one giving the ride in the, the mid ground. Um, and in the foreground on, the, on this side is her, is her daughter. And so I just want you to like take note of what she's doing, um, the, the quality of her skin and pigment and so forth. And so this is her today, okay? So she's been rewilded into native forest in Thailand and she's been there for a few years now. Um, and no longer giving rides um, and uh, has her daughter with her. Um, and so to, to return her to the forest, um, the organization that I, I work with, Mahout's Elephant Foundation, um, they organized um, her return. And to do that, they trekked with her and her daughter um, about 130 kilometers over eight days to get her from the tourist camp into, back into the forest. Um, and so this was a really wonderful moment um, and sort of in some cases a miraculous moment to, um, right, to get her from this, from this stage to this stage. And here's another image of her as well um, in, the, in the forest. So um, Sarah Blaine, who is the CEO and co-founder of Mahout's Elephant Foundation, um, she, along with many of the other photographs, um, also gave me this photograph. And um, although I wasn't there for the, for the return of, of the elephants into the forest, um, she shared this really wonderful story with me. Um, and she, she often speaks about it too because it's, it's so um, um, important um, in the life of these elephants and, and quite um, heart-rending at the same time. So this was the, uh, um, shortly after they were returned to the, the forest. And so um, it was the first time in a long time that um, this matriarch, in this case, um, had the opportunity to make 
a decision for herself. And so she, on return to the, the forest, they went down to the river, they bathed, and then she signaled to her a family that it was now time to leave the water and explore elsewhere. Um, so it was a really important moment that going from you know, giving chair rides, um, eating supplemental food that wasn't necessarily he healthy, to be able to say, I'm gonna bathe when I wanna bathe, and I'm gonna stop bathing when I um, stop bathing, and I'm gonna do this with my family. And here is just another image of um, three of the elephants that were um, that are in this protected forest. The young one, who's a little bit older now, um, she was pregnant with him at the time of the walk. So he's known only the forest. Um, so he was born in the forest and, and has known only that. I also want to point out, so I'm going to show you a video of this male elephant. And so while he wasn't in any of the camps. He did experience social disruption early in his life, um, separated from his mom at a, f a fairly young age. And he um, displays, let's see if I can get it to play. He, split, he displays the, the behavior, that, you know, the stereotypical swaying that we see in cap more in captive zoo elephants and other um, elephants in restrictive settings. I just wanna see, I haven't even tried, no. Yeah, um, yeah, let's see if we can get this to play. Yeah, that's probably great. Okay, so, so he was, um, so, but this was his return to the, this particular forest and, and now being re reunited with family members. And so I just want to show you, so upon his initial return, he would do this quite often. And he's not a very confident elephant, um, and he's very sensitive as well. So this, he would do this oftentimes um, at moments of frustration, of decision making, um, and he would do it for quite a while, again, upon the initial return to the forest. And at this point, we see it almost not at all. So, so that behavior has, I think through, through the development of, exp of the, ch the opportunity for exploration, for building confidence, um, for the social buffering that the, his family provides, his confidence has just built up and he's more comfortable. We see it sometimes a little bit when, again, still in moments of frustration or when he's presented with something that he hasn't done before, but it'll be for like, you know, seconds, as opposed to in some cases, the minutes we saw um, in the early stages. So this is him um, as well. Um, I told my, my husband um, that I would leave him in a heartbeat for this elephant <laughs> if he'd have me. He's so wonderful. Um, and he just, he just completely captures um, my heart. Um, he's just, like I said, he's very sensitive. Um, he's kind of goofy. Um, when I first met him, he just sat on a termite mound. Uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, he's just quite, he's just be quite beautiful. So this is just showing where, just generally where we work in Thailand um, and just the general region. We have a few sites um, where we work. And it's important to note, um, well, let me just show you some of the beautiful vistas um, in, the, in these areas in the forest that um, we work in. Here's another view of beautiful native um, habitat for these elephants. Um, and it's important to note that what m makes this, this project so, so doable and possible is that it's very much community driven. Um, so we work with indigenous Karen people um, in these villages. Um, it's, it's important to note when you hear captive elephant, it is a legal term in Thailand, right? A captive elephant is an owned elephant, right? So you might say an elephant in captivity Right, that might mean something or not, but a captive elephant is always an owned elephant. So even these rewilded elephants that I work with, oops, I, sh I shouldn't be touching that. Sorry if, to the WebEx people if I'm touching my microphone, um, that they, they still remained owned, 
right? So this is something, this is a, a, a fact, right, or a constraint or an issue that those of us who are interested in the conservation and the protection of Asian elephants have to consider, have to contend with, have to factor in. Right? And so Karen communities own quite a number of the Asian elephants. They may own up to thousands of these, um, or hundreds in some cases, across these Karen communities. Um, so in many cases, the Karen communities have reached out to Mahout's Elephant Foundation because they're interested in a way to keep their elephants out of the camps and protect their forest. And so um, Mahout's Elephant Foundation has gotten involved in finding an ecotourist model to do that, right? So to, to maintain the elephants in the forest, um, either keep them there in some cases or get them out of the camps in other cases, um, keep them in the, get them to the forest and also provide, help provide an, an, al an alternative income to these families, right? Help them may have a sustainable income that is separate from or different than having to work the elephant, right? So instead of a tourist going to an elephant camp and expecting to ride an elephant, to bathe an elephant, for an elephant to perform for the tourist, right? Instead, it's more safari style where you're on the elephant's time and on their terms, right? So you're entering into the, the community, you're trekking out into native elephant for, um, forest, and you're observing and coming upon the elephants. Um, and so, so, like I said, this is very much community driven. It wouldn't be possible without the, the drive of these families. Um, and again, it's, it's an important consideration that these elephants remain owned. Um, in some cases, Mahout's Elephant Foundation becomes a partner in that ownership it, as further means of security that these elephants will always stay in the forest. So these are just some of the wonderful people that we have the opportunity to work with. So one of the things we ask, right, if we're talking about this idea of returning or using the term rewilding elephants to, to their habitat, what does it mean to be wild? And a lot of my research really focuses on that question. What does it mean for an animal or an individual to be wild? Right, so we're asking, right, for the elephants themselves, what is at the heart of being wild? So this, this is asking us to step outside of our sort of maybe outdated notions of wild, particularly in our 21st century landscape where humans have so much impact upon um, other animals. And the other question we ask, right, so what is at the heart of being wild for these elephants? But also, how do we return the power of it to these elephants, to these individuals that have been stripped of it? Right, and you can think about this not just for the captive community, but also uh, for disadvantaged wild populations that are so impacted by human behavior actions disturbance. So it's important for us to pause and think about, well, why do we even privilege wild, right? And we do, right? It's certainly privileged in the conservation community. And you can think about the IUCN priorities and guidelines and how they determine threats, right? Often that is in terms of the purity and the idea of this notion of wild, wildness, et cetera, right? So some things about why we privilege wild, because it gives, it's a sense of autonomy, right, individuality. There's a range of choice, right, and that includes positive challenges, right? We're not always talking about good things, right, no stress, but we're talking about important positive challenges and the level of choice. There's a sense of agency associated with wild and being wild, right? There's a notion of dignity involved in our notion of being wild too, and just general opportunity. So I'm using this image, one of my graduate students, who I'll, I'll show you a picture of her in a moment, she uses this, she's been using this in some talks that she's been giving um, to introduce well, what, is, what is wild and what is domesticated, right? What's the domestic animal? Because elephants are, you know, captive elephants are also talked about as being domestic, right? So here's a picture of um, wolves. 
And um, my graduate student likes to juxtapose this with Marnie. So Chelsea, and I'll show you a picture of her in a moment. Mar um, Chelsea follows Marnie on Instagram, just to show you right that 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 deep disparity between what what wild might be and a notion of domesticated. And Chelsea also likes to point out maybe a little inbreeding here as well with with Marnie. moment okay right so when thinking about wildness then for elephants so Richard Lair who spent most of his adult life in in Asian Southeast Asia working for and on by on behalf of Asian elephants he is famously um, quoted as saying a domesticated elephant is simply a wild elephant in chains and he went on to say in a really impassioned keynote speech um, for um, the Forest and Agricultural Organization for the UN, he went on to say, if you capture a wild elephant and put it in chains, it is then domesticated. That is actually the definition of a domestic elephant. Take it from the wild, tame it, it is domesticated. Right? If you release into an appropriate place, a preconditioned domesticated elephant, and most in Asia are already pre-adapted. Is everything okay? Yes. Okay. Oh, sorry. No, that's not you. Okay. Um, right, and most in Asia are already pre-adapted, it will very likely become a wild elephant. Okay, so this is really important to keep in mind when we talk about what are the capacities, the capabilities of an Asian elephant, regardless of life experience, to be returned to native forest, to be rewilded. Let's see if we can get this to advance. Hmm. We're pausing. So maybe I'll, while we fix that, right, we can talk about what the scientific definition of, am I doing anything up there, Jim, to disrupt the, okay. Um, okay, thank you. So I'm just gonna go back and just finish that thought, right? How we scientifically define a domesticated animal or a domesticated species. Um, and this is where I would, in my teacher mode, would stop and ask someone in the audience, <laughs> is that permitted? Can I do that? Or do you want me to just keep going? Does anyone want to offer any thoughts on what, how, in, in, from the science method or a sort of model of domestication, how we, we would define a truly domesticated, and Marnie might be an example of that, but anyone want to offer some thoughts? Some students? <laughs> Okay, so loss of aggression, right? So a trait, a really significant trait change, right? Right. So maybe not aggression, and certainly there's a big range of individual variation, but you know a significant trait change, right, from the a wild counterpart to a domesticated, yeah. Uh, perhaps when the animal is breeding, it becomes centered around human needs, so that animal's input into the world um, already in a domesticated environment. Uh, okay, so. So, oh, say that again? Okay, so we still, have, I mean, elephants do breed in captivity, um, but in terms of, so sometimes that works, but met, some of the captive elephants are still breeding with wild bulls in some cases. Um, so it, it varies a little bit with the Asian elephant um, community. Um, but oftentimes, go, you know, it does relate to this selective breeding for traits, right? Over many, many generations. Um, to produce an, a species or a, an animal, right, that in the end differs quite a bit from that, that, that wild counterpart or ancestor. Now, there's, there's debate there, too, because in, I talk about this with my farm animal sanctuary research, right, thinking about how much those farm animals still maintain the legacy of their evolutionary past, right? And we as humans sort of discount that way more than we should. Um, but certainly for Asian elephants, there's, there's even less of a, a distance there in terms of their capabilities. So going back to Richard Lair's notion that a domesticated elephant is simply a wild elephant in chains, right? Oops, I think we're back to the issue. <laughs> 
I just want you to keep coming up here, Jenny. That's good exercise. <laughs> Should I use that way. instead? No, it just like forgets it, okay. that it's a PowerPoint. I'm too slow. Okay. Right, so what does then it mean to be wild for, for these elephants? What does being wild mean? And then again, in our research, right, in empirical research, asking how do we return this to those animals that have been stripped of it? So we think of this as a compassionate model for conservation, right, where we're taking into the fold the entire community of Asian elephants, both captive and free. Right? The idea that we are going to rescue right, the elephants that are living in these various forms of captivity. Many of them are going to need rehabilitation. Right? So those of you who uh, have those skills, either from a veterinary perspective or, or otherwise, right? so to rehabilitate them, right? to help restore the physical health, right? the, the, the skills they might need, the confidence, the cognitive ability, just providing exposure to these things right? is going to be needed depending upon the, the, life, the past life that an elephant might have. Right? And then with the aspiration, the goal, and this might be a little bit different for every elephant depending upon the severity of their past, right? Rewild them to protected native forest. And this is possible in Thailand. Um, and so, and we can talk, there, it's not easy, but it's certainly possible and something we find aspirational. Right, and so what we believe is really possible is that a state of being wild, right, that is meaningful to the elephants, we can attain this in this landscape, in Thailand, in native habitat, where importantly both the elephant and the human cultures are valued. So in order to do this, one of the things we have to look at is understanding the behavioral, rehabilitative, ecological needs, and I would say even psychological needs of these elephants, right? To understand them as individuals. So here's where I want to introduce um, Chelsea's work. There's a, quite a bit of work that we're doing, um, but I don't have the time to talk about all of it. So I'm going to focus on work that um, Chelsea, as a master's student, is helping to um, develop. And so she's been using activity budgets and also GIS to understand these behavioral and ecological needs of, of the elephants that we work with that have been returned to the forest. So here's just showing an the, one of the areas that we're working, um, one of her field sites in Thailand. And just a closer satellite view of this area, so indicating sort of the human development, human settlement, the, the caring community, and the surrounding forest. And here's just a vista um, from one of those sites. So quite a privileged area to be working in. Right, so what is the methodology um, that she's um, developing? You're sharing your screen. Oh, yes, I am sharing my screen. OK, um, so, so part of it is actually, and this is where just basic behavioral ecological methodology comes into play. We're not reinventing the wheel necessarily, right? But we're using a lot of really important method methodologies, right, to understand um, these animals to help us understand greater questions, right? Um, and so, so deeper questions in many cases, right? So looking at activity budgets, how do they spend their day, right? As a group and as individuals, right? So looking at sort of their general behavior, their general activities, and also the individual variation among them, which is really important and often overlooked. Also looking at foraging behavior. So foraging for a lot of the animals, including us, right, is really important, right? It's, um, it's very entangled with many other things. And this is very true of elephants, too. So sometimes you look at um, activity budgets, or what we call um, ethograms of, of elephants or other species, and it's like they're just eating, right? They're just taking in the food. It's very sort of utilitarian or transactional. But, right, if we pay closer attention, these sort, this foraging 
ecology and ecology, is, again, is very entangled, it's very wrapped up with so many other things, exploration, social interaction, et cetera, right? And so she's going to look closer at the foraging ecology, the foraging behavior of these elephants, right? To, to really get at the nuance of, of, the, of what's really going on in the lives of these elephants. Because as we'll show you, and you may already know, they spend a lot of their day foraging, right? 18 hours a day could be in foraging related behaviors. Just so, it's pretty important, right? And, and it's clearly not just about calories, right? So to overlook that is really negligent and so something we want to really delve into. Um, and she'll also be looking at home range. So just um, how much these elephants move, right? And not just their walking distance, which is important in and of itself, but the behaviors that are coupled with that walking distance, what they're doing as they're moving through their, their habitat. So if you're a behaviorist like me, ethograms are really important. So I, in, my, in the room here, and on WebEx, you can also raise your hand. Who's worked with ethograms before? You should be raising your hand, Katie. No, <laughs> I'm really pointing you out. Right, so we have some who's worked with ethograms. Um, anyone raising their hand on WebEx? No, that's okay. <laughs> right? <laughs> What's that? Um, so ethograms are really fundamental because they provide the basic of information from which we're going to develop our ideas and, and the way that we can even, the lens through which we start to understand other, other beings, right? So we kind of informally do ethograms of other humans that we meet all the time, right? So it, very generally, it's a catalog or inventory of behaviors for an animal, for a species, Etc. right? So it can be very comprehensive and it can be very specific, right? But where we're describing specific behavior. So here's just an example of an ethogram. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I just wanna point out what this is because often with behavioral work, the first step is to go and watch the animals and do just observe and take, right, narrative notes on those individuals to understand who they are, what they're doing and so forth, right? So you have your category, it might be an umbrella term like maintenance behaviors or foraging or playing, and more specific behaviors under that like bath, scratch, swatching, elimination, um, and so forth. And then you'll have a very a more specific description of what the behavior is so that you reliably observe it, that many, if it's more than one observer, it can be reliably recorded among those um, observers and so forth, right? And it, you, if not necessarily t taking the time now, but the definition, the description itself should be devoid of motivation or interpretation, right? We don't necessarily know why, right? A scratch has a grooming behavior, has different motivations depending upon the individual, depending upon the context. So, Chelsea and the, um, others in the research team, right, were, tasks with, were tasked with developing a very comprehensive um, ethogram, inventory of behavior for the elephants, right? And so this is um, play behavior, social play behavior, right, is just one aspect of it. And um, one of the ones we're, we're paying attention to um, as a sign of, um, well, play behavior, privileged behaviors, like when I mentioned the kangaroos at the very beginning, um, those sorts of behaviors are the ones to sort of abate in a more disturbed environment, in a more stressful environment, right? We see those, we see the play behaviors um, go away when other, other things take priority. Um, so we're attending to, paying, you know, paying attention to play behavior in, um, in, our, in our elephants. And they're just really cute pictures, so I just want to take the time to show them. The other thing we're doing is, so again, looking at home range, their, their spatial use, their walking distance. So in order to do that, we're, we're using um, two different devices that we're, uh, Chelsea's gonna pilot this summer. Now, the typical um, method for this for elephants is the collar. Right, a quite a cumbersome collar, um, which um, I, I'm opposed to. Right, um, so we 
from the ethical position of, of the research program, we had to find the two constraints, or we had ethical constraint of we're not going to use the typical collar. Um, and another constraint we had was ecological. It's really dense forest. Right, so, me, so it's very difficult to get signaling in a, in a reliable way. So how are we gonna contend with that? Um, because these elephants, and I haven't gone into this much, and I can talk about this after, but again, these are owned elephants, and as owned elephants, they've developed over their lives a relationship with a mahout, an elephant guardian. Um, and now, like any professional term, right, Mahout also can mean, can, can run the spectrum of professionalism, right? So you can, again, like any profession, you can have a really amazing, wonderful vet, right? That is extremely ethical. Um, you can have a really wonderful, amazing mahout, right? That is, is the exemplar of how you, what, what you'd wanna see in terms of a relationship with another animal. And then a mahout could just be someone who takes on that term because they've been hired. They have no elephant experience, but they've just been hired by an elephant camp, right? So in the case of the mahouts that we work with, they're on that exemplar end of, of having a lot of elephant experience where they're not there for co coercion, for manipulation, they're there as elephant guardians. Um, so it's important to keep in mind, um, just as background, that these elephants maintain that, that mahout or human um, relationship. And w this is okay, right? Elephants are extremely intelligent, complex animals. They have very complex cognitive capacities. They are able to navigate complex relationships within their species and without, right? Particularly if the relationship is a healthy one. Um, and so we're going, the, the mahouts, the elephant guardians are going to use handheld devices, right, to supplement um, uh, the, the fact that we may not get reliable signaling in the, in the forest. Um, so they might be able to take um, opportunity of a clearing in the forest to, to get a ping we're also working with a company to develop, so you can see the device that we've modeled. This is, this is just um, fashioned on. This is not actually on the elephant yet. This is just a, um, uh, an illustration. But developing a device that's quite light, right, that sits on the nape, because we need it on the nape um, of the neck, and something that can also be taken off um, in the evening if need be. So it's a non-permanent um, device. Um, it's it's quite light. Um, we don't have the I don't have the final weight, but in terms of what an elephant can um, um, carry, it might be similar to sorry about the microphone. Similar to my, the necklace, right? A, a sort of a substantial necklace. Um, so between those two devices, trying to get an understanding of of the walking distance um, that these elephants engage in. So just to show some preliminary um, results and also some comparing um, to different types of environments. So in terms of foraging related behaviors, what we're seeing so far in our rewilded elephants is not surprisingly, they're engaging in a lot of foraging related behaviors. More than 50% of their time is doing that. And so this is in comparison to the data we have from wild populations and from captive, mostly zoo literature, right? So we're, we're close to what we're seeing in quote unquote wild populations um, and, and well above the, the, zoo, the zoo populations for, for Asian elephants. And then for movement, um, so we've done some preliminary work, a little bit rough with the movement of our, of our elephants. We're, we're about at 20% um, of locomotion um, and comparing that generally to the wild population, nine to 30% of their day. And then quite both, again, comparable to wild populations and well above what we're seeing in captive, mainly um, zoo Asian elephants. So 
we don't have a sense of home range yet. Um, and home range for, not surprisingly, for, for an animal and for elephants can vary quite a bit based on resource availability. So the, whether there's a lot of core habitat, whether it's fragmented, the water resources, et cetera. So the literature shows that it can range in some cases from 15 square kilometers upwards to 600, depending upon those, those characteristics. And just wanting to point out, right, that, you know, thinking about all of these things, like how much time they would spend in foraging related behaviors in terms of moving, what their general home range might be, compared to how many hours per day a ca an elephant in the tourist camps are actually chained. And on average, it's about 19 to 9 to 18 hours per day, chained on a very small chain in most cases. So in thinking about this model, compassionate model of conservation in terms of rescue, rehabilitation, and rewilding, right? We're thinking about it in terms of a model for conservation where wild, right, this notion of being wild doesn't belong to status at birth, right? So this is really asking the conservation communities, um, the, even the animal protection communities to think beyond what wild means, right? That it's not just if you're born into the wild, then you are, but thinking about what is possible for an individual's life, right? How to restore being wild, right? The power of being wild to those that have been stripped of it. And again, just as an aside, I would say this, this is something we need to think about for disadvantaged um, populations, right? The, um, that are of wild populations that are just so impacted by humans. Um, and so this notion that of conservation and animal, prote animal protection that is striving to provide to these elephants, captive and free, right, a, a chance at a life worth living. So I, again, sort of speaking to conservation and animal protection communities and people coming um, forth into this world, right, that the priorities for these communities have to reflect the threats that are fa faced by the entire species, right? Not just um, prioritizing what the wild population is, is experiencing as if they're in isolation or a vacuum or in a silo, but understanding that the captive and free populations are entirely entangled. What happens to one impacts the other, right? So saying that these priorities must um, reflect the threats faced by the entire species, both captive and free. So with that, I want to thank um, a whole range of people, Sarah and Felix Blaine, who are um, co-founded Mahout's Elvin Foundation, Becca Winkler, um, who is a student of mine. Katie, you might know her, right? So she's um, um, doing her PhD at UPenn right now in anthropology. Ch Chelsea Greer, who's a master student of mine, um, who's worked on the project for a while. Elodie Mathieu, who's um, from France, who's a research um, fellow. Mara, who's also a research fellow and has done a lot with our project. And we have two um, social psychologists that are from Princeton and St. Mary's College that are helping us with their expertise understand um, what it means to be wild um, from their um, understanding of, of human social psychology. And then I just want to just, um, just take a moment to advertise the fact that we have a field course um, every summer in Thailand. Um, for people who are looking to um, gain um, experience in applied behavioral ecology um, with the elephants. And if you're interested in research opportunities or potential collaborations, to absolutely reach out and speak with me. And with that, I'll thank you and take any questions. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, Katie. So that's a really um, big question and something that's going, for, for a given elephant, is going to require um, a fair bit of, uh, maybe you can see, like in the case of the elephants that um, I've shown you here, they were fairly ready to go. The male who did the swaying needed a little bit more time and um, assistance, but he, his real rehabilitation really came from being with his family and being in the environment. He didn't otherwise have any physical problems, et cetera. But for other elephants who are, and I don't know if anyone has experienced any of these, these camps, um, 
some of these elephants are in really bad shape, both from a psychological and physical perspective, and they would, um, they would require a fair bit of rehabilitation from an expert staff. Some are so physically at an older stage or um, have such physical or health issues that going into a, a sanctuary setting might actually be better for them. So this might not be the case to an elephant, right? But I would say for the majority of elephants that this is possible. But that, but that assessment would need to take place for sure. And that's where like a team really is important, a team of experts with a variety of expertise. Yeah, a really good question. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so, so that's a really good question. And I would say this is at the stage of, hey, this is possible. We have these small pockets of, of where we're, we're seeing success. Can this be scaled up in a way? And in order to do that, that would, that would involve the Thai government. Yeah, and so that's another level of, right, um, of integration that, um, that hasn't happened yet, but certainly, I mean, that's, that would be the goal to get the Thai government, to get scientists that are work with the Thai government involved with this. The Thai government um, had a, did have a rewilding project where they rewilded um, over 100 um, captive elephants. And I know there's a report just coming, going to come out now. They just had a meeting in February re thinking about how the captive elephant population can help bolster wild populations. So it's something that they're, they're considering, um, but um, how you do it, right? And to understand, so in the case when the Thai government um, or the royal family is involved, that brings resources that um, otherwise aren't there and because they can own those out. So they're still owned elephants, right? But now they're owned um, by the royal family in some cases. So that, that removes the need to provide an income to the, the families, right? But a great question and something that will require, right, an, an entire country to make happen in many cases. Yeah, Ginny. Uh, I have one, actually a couple from online. First one is from Map student Tanya. <laughs> Hi, thank you for a great talk. You mentioned that wildlife tourism could involve a safari-type excursion with Asian elephants. Have people tried this yet? I wonder if tourists will choose this option compared to the ones more interactive with the elephants. Right, so that's a great question. So the, the sites that I work with with Mahout's Elephant Foundation are all safari style. So they do, there are a few um, sites that do that where you're trekking out, you're um, entering into their habitat, it's observation only, you're watching the elephants be elephants. Um, again, they're still maintaining, the elephants are maintaining their relationship with their elephant guardian, which in this environment we actually think is okay. For one, I'll just, I'm just going on in the side here for a second, because there's, it, it also helps mitigate potential conflict because through their bond, um, the mahouts, the elephant guardians, can deter them from entering cornfields, right? So, it, so that human-elephant relationship, when healthy, when reciprocal, can be really important, again, in this highly disturbed 21st century landscape. Um, so it is happening um, that there are these models. And th the other part of her question, um, was whether uh, tourists, right? So, so tourists sort of their desire, their motivation to do something really easy, like here's a tour bus that's gonna just take us to a camp and we can just, because it's, you know, touching an elephant, like if you can bathe with an elephant, right? It's okay, I can, and you're, you're not otherwise educated in the impact, the ramifications of that. Well, that sounds lovely, right? Um, but there are important ramifications of bathing, for example. So, so there's the ease, right? And a lot of the tourist camps really sort of speak to that ease of we can get you to these elephants, you can see these elephants, you can tick that off your box as a tourist. I saw an Asian elephant, yeah, whatever, it painted for me, it wasn't in the wild, but maybe that for some tourists that's what they, they all they care about. But part of it is, and I think there's a, a population of, the, of tourists that 
that they're always going to go for convenience, right? Convenience, or they just may not be interested in those consequences. But part of it is, and this is where involving tourist companies, is tourist education, right? And a lot of companies are becoming more aware of that and not booking with certain camps to avoid the welfare implications and so forth. Yeah, so I think um, it's, it, again, it, it's a multi-pronged problem and also a multi-pronged solution. Yeah. You had a question? Yeah, um, I was just thinking about like the definitions of like domestic and wild animals, and it, it seems I'm from more of a zoo background. Mm -hmm. It definitely seems to really fit with what um, what we use in our like scientific lingo. So, for example, we would call a domestic animal. It's either your domestic animal or your wildlife, right? So mm -hmm. Marnie, right, that was, they were <laughs> yeah. Kind of like over the years, engineered by humans. Right. Look the way they are, yep. and behave the way they are. And then everything else is wildlife. So when you, um, when we talk about um, like animals that are housed in a zoo or in an aquarium, they are captive wildlife. Yeah. So then that brings in the more like the situational perspective, mm -hmm. the wildlife part of things. Yeah. And there's three different categories for that. So you either have Mm -hmm. The settings that we know of in North America and Europe where it's more juvenile. Sure, yeah. There's a semi-free ranging, which is something that looks like... Sure, yeah. Right, and right. other people have, like, lab, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then there's a free ranging, which is, like, really just... Like, wild, like, right, what we think of as wild. Human yeah. Human yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it would be difficult to interpret the results from one domain, like veterinary medicine, to something that's more like... Yeah, right, right. Because, like, I wouldn't call that rewilding. Sure. I would just say putting, like, uh, elephants that are already wildlife into a semi-free-ranging situation. Sure, right. And, and yeah, beneficial. right. And you're not alone, you're not alone in that, right? And that you're not alone in that assessment of how, right? And so like Joyce Poole, for example, um, she would call them liberated elephants, not, not rewilded, for example. But I would, so I'm sort of, sort of hoping to break boundaries. So the, and that's the question of what does it mean to be wild from the animal's perspective and, of, and moving beyond our human constructs of semi-wild, captive, wild uh, life, but actually asking it from the perspective uh, and the capabilities of these elephants. And therefore, what is our responsibility to, to these animals, to these elephants, in terms of the kind of life we help them attain? Yeah. So, so I think that from a, from a semantic perspective or from a, 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 a perspective of terminology, we can, we can combat that in terms of the literature so, those, 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 so that we're not being bogged down by, by terms, by, but we're, by vocabulary, but we're moving beyond that to say we're asking uh, at a greater level that this, this, what being wild means. Yeah, it's not so much about where you're held, the space that you're in, um, but, but talking about it from, from the, something inherent, intrinsic to the animal um, in, terms of cap in terms of capacity, capabilities, and so forth, and really understanding that, that evolutionary link. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you for coming. Yeah. There's one online. Um, Jane asked, um, loved the talk. From the restoration ecology perspective, it stands out to me that you were discussing rewilding without referencing the quality of the land or its amount of wildness versus human modified qualities. Can you talk more about making the leap from land-based concepts of rewilding to rewilding from the point of view of the animals, either as a species or individuals? Sure. Yeah, and that, so that's that's a good point, right? Because a lot of rewilding is very much from the from the. In, that land-based or, or um, environment perspective. And w what we're saying, I think there are certain things that are absolutely necessary, and, and this will bear itself out with more research and more understanding, that are very necessary for these animals, for these elephants. And I think 
forage, the ability to forage, and all that that means is, is going to be really vital, right? So, so yes, that actually links to land and environment. However, right, we're still asking from, from the well-being perspective of the elephants, what is going to facilitate a high level of well-being? So for a lot of assessments of um, of well-being or welfare, right? There, a lot of them refer, sort of lean on externalities as opposed to animal-specific um, um, parameters, and we're looking to av avoid that. Um, and so, so some of the things that we're looking at. So we think we think. Right, so forage, um, vegetation is all going to be very important, so there's an inherent link to land. Um, but we're not necessarily focusing on this pristine notion of wilderness. So we're, we're trying to decouple the notion of rewilding from a, a notion of wilderness that no longer exists exists um, and hasn't existed for a really long time. And a lot of the restoration ecology um, work that focuses on rewilding still really is heavily um, in, um, sort of entrenched in that notion of wilderness. Um, and we're, we're, we're sort of stepping away from that. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah? Okay. Wonderful. Thank you again. Thanks so much.